Arctic continues to be transformed and impacted by global forces, from declining sea ice on the Arctic Ocean, through new summers of devastating wildland fires, to the wide-reaching political consequences of Russia's war against Ukraine. The Arctic is also a vibrant and varied region and homeland, and marked by three decades of post-Cold War efforts at strengthening circumpolar governance. What options are there for moving Arctic governance forward, and what needs to be done first? Welcome to this episode of The World Stage. My name is Alana Wilson-Rove. I am a research professor at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, and we've been exploring this question here. I'm delighted to be joined today to talk Arctic governance with two deeply knowledgeable people working on the front lines, Edward Alexander, co-chair of the Gwich'in Council International, and Jennifer Spence, who is a senior fellow at the Arctic Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School. Let's say hello first. Ed, can you tell us a little about what first brought you into Arctic governance work? Well, I started with uh, Gwich'in Council International about 10 years ago. Um, the chiefs of the Yukon Flats appointed me to the role, and so it was kind of, uh, there was a necessity to uh, increase our, our role in Arctic governance, increase our role as GCI to uh, further develop positions, and, and so um, I was asked to do it, and I responded, and we, we've been moving ever since to try to increase our presence and uh and, and all of the Arctic affairs uh, beyond just uh, our own area in Alaska, the Yukon Territory, and the Northwest Territories in Canada. Great. And some of our listeners will be somewhat new to the Arctic area. Could you tell us a little bit more about the Gwich'in Council International and how it works? So Gwich'in Council International is, like a, is a government uh, body, essentially, for all of the different uh, Gwich'in peoples in Alaska, the Yukon Territory, and the Northwest Territory. We have a eight-member board. Uh, four are appointed by the chiefs in Alaska. Two are appointed by uh, the Buntut Gwich'in First Nation and the Yukon Territory. And then we have two more appointed uh, by the Gwich'in Tribal Council in the Northwest Territories. Uh, all of our membership is uh, composed of Gwich'in governments and, uh, and all of them at that. Oh, great. Can't wait to hear more about the work you're doing as we progress in this conversation. But let's turn to Jen, to you. Can you share a little bit about what brought you into this suite of Arctic issues we're discussing today? Well, I come to Arctic governance with both a passion uh, from an academic side, but also as a practitioner. Um, I really have found that the Arctic is a place where there's a, a lot of opportunity for innovation. And uh, to do uh, justice to the Gwich'in Council International, I think that the Gwich'in Council International in particular has demonstrated uh, an, an amazing contribution and shows us what, uh, when we look beyond governments, uh, to look at what uh, governance can look like. It's a really kind of exciting place where you see peoples involved in government at governance at, at a circumpolar level. Um, so my work has been uh, both sort of exploring the flexibility of it, um, but also I worked for the Arctic Council as the executive secretary of the Sustainable Development Working Group, um, and in that time really got to get a sense of what it means on the ground. And, and so from that perspective, it's been really exciting and, and interesting to see how things have been evolving. Also wonderful to hear, and also for our kind of non-Arctic nerd listeners, can you say a little bit more about the Sustainable Development Working Group and kind of... Absolutely. So the Arctic Council is, is sort of seen as the sort of forum in the Arctic where the eight Arctic states have come together. So that's Canada, Norway, Sweden, Finland, uh, Kingdom of Denmark, United States through Alaska, and Russia. Did I get them all? Someone check me. I was counting. It sounds great. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and so through this forum, but it, what's important is that six permanent participant organizations, which are the indigenous peoples, also sit at the table with these states. And they really very much provide that forum for peoples to have a say. Um, but the work of the Arctic Council really takes place in six different working groups, one of which is the Sustainable Development Working Group. So there's what I, and this is my generalization and bias, so you have a number of working groups looking at biodiversity and uh, environmental monitoring and emergency management and response. I like to think of the Sustainable Development Working Group as the people, the human dimension of the Arctic Council. So really looking at the cultural, economic, and social components of what it means to, to have cooperation in the Arctic. Yeah. Well, that's the, the perfect segue into what we're going to talk about next. Because uh, there's no question that Russia's reinvasion of Ukraine in 2022 had an impact on these kind of pretty remarkable structures of Arctic governance that have 
have developed, as you say, bringing people into governance and so on, very innovative. Um, and a level of reaction has since been resumed when Norway assumed the chairship of the body. And as you said, a lot of activity also takes place lower down in the Arctic Council, not necessarily where the politicians will meet, but where longstanding you know, working groups um, involving Arctic states, indigenous peoples, organizations, and NGOs actively contribute. So I think the, the impacts and ways forward are really interesting to explore. And so with that, I'd like to go back to you, Ed, and ask you, how was the pause in Arctic cooperation experienced by GCI, Gwich'in Council International, and what turned out to be some of the ways forward in that tricky time? It's, well, it's still a tricky time, right? I mean, I think we're still kind of balancing a lot of, uh, a lot of the outcomes from that. And so, um, but I'd say during the time period, uh, of course, we were, we were sort of glued to our televisions like everybody, right, and, and surprised by the, the action and so forth to uh, reinvade Ukraine. Um, you know, Gwich'in Council International is in a little bit of a different position than other uh, permanent participant organizations in that uh, we don't have direct exposure to uh, Russia. We don't have people in, in Russia. We didn't. Um, don't have those considerations. Uh, and so we were able to uh, say things that I think probably others weren't able to say, and which was that, uh, you know, um, talking about our concern about the invasion itself, talking about our concern for indigenous peoples in Ukraine, talking about our concern for indigenous peoples in Russia, you know, going to the front lines of that conflict. And so I think that that was, um, you know, directly what uh, our leadership had wanted us to express was the, the regret there. But, um, you know, when we think about um, how we, how we um, approached the whole thing was, um, uh, I think it's interesting. Um, it's interesting to see everybody's different response to it. But at the same time, it's like, um, we have to remember that it's, uh, it's more than just like uh, what we're talking about here. <laughs> there's very real consequences you know it, when we think about like the um, you know the last time I, I saw both of you are in, in Iceland here recently and uh, the NATO commander had spoke about you know the uh, Ukraine getting shelled six million shells a year or some some ridiculous amount of, of shelling that's occurring of Ukraine um, you know it's it's uh, becomes very real right um, but I think the other side of the coin to all of that is that there are other things that are very real. Uh, you know, climate change is very real. Um, wildland fire in the north is very real. The 40 million acres that burned in Russia is very real, right? The 40 million acres that burned in Canada this year, is, or you know, those are very real impacts to people in the north. And so uh, we have to kind of look at all of the different things that are occurring simultaneously and try to figure out where we can work with other people uh, and with, work with other states on uh, to advance things. And so sometimes you have to uh, have kind of a, a clear vision of, of what that can look like and, um, and how we can, we can go forward. Sometimes that requires a pause. Sometimes that requires everybody to go back to their respective people and, and evaluate how we want to work together. And I think that that was um, something that definitely occurred here and and the different states had they look at what they were doing and the different permanent participants looked at what they were doing and said is there a spot for us to work here can we still talk with each other you know and uh, trying to figure out that way forward was um, it's not easy right but it's uh, I believe necessary and there have been some important you know even as the Arctic Council has its way of working established protocols and so on there have been moments of innovation Right, and both before this pause and the gradual resumption of activity towards the Norwegian chairship in May 2023, do you have any examples that you think would be, or kind of maybe indicate some of the ways of working when times are difficult? Well, I think the establishment of the Arctic Council itself is um, is you know it was born in difficult times, right? It was not uh, born into uh, easy times. It was a product of. Uh, the Cold War of of trying to reach across and have difficult dialogues is not a it's not an easy thing, and so the people involved from the very beginning have been um, kind of composed of a creative force, right? And that creative force has emerged in lots of different ways. One is having permanent participants at the table, 
right? And that that's unique to the Arctic Council, um, having the body be um, not not a, um, a dedicated international law body, but one that can inform international law, right? One that we uh, sit around and, and, and we talk and we get consensus on issues instead of having uh, some of these kind of binding votes of, you know, these objectors and, and so forth. And so I think that that creative force is kind of really embedded in the DNA of the Arctic Council, but then it's emerged in, in different ways, like uh, the creation of task forces uh, within the Arctic Council that have led to binding agreements outside of the Arctic Council, right? So uh, you think about the search and rescue, you think about um, marine oil spill you know, prevention and response, the MOSPA agreement, you think about um, those kinds of things as like um, innovations, uh, you know, during uh, the Finland chair chairship, um, there was, uh, you know, a lot of uh, dialogue in the run-up to the uh, to the uh, ministerial meeting in, in Rovaniemi about uh, the Finnish declaration. And that declaration was eventually kind of squashed, right, because of, um, at that time, United States objections. Uh, in including climate change uh, as language in that agreement. And so, um, you know, then you think about what was the response from the rest of the group? What was the response from the permanent participants? What was the response from the Finnish chairship? And, I, and you know, they came up with an innovative response, which was um, a chairship declaration, right? It was like, a not, well, not a declaration, but a chairship statement, excuse me. So, um, which we hadn't seen up until that point, right? But it was something that was allowed and, and nobody objected to, to that. And so I think the, the notion that um, the Arctic Council retains its uh, identity as a creative space to try to find ways to have dialogue has always been there, um, but hasn't always been seen from outside of the Arctic Council, right? And so we have these, these, these constructive dialogues there. And sometimes uh, what comes out isn't what it, what's expected, like a finished chairship statement or uh, a pause or going to written procedure or having uh, the permanent participants meet with um, the Norwegian chair and Kirkenes, right? And so we have uh, different outcomes, uh, different kinds of creative ways of working that I think are really important um, because sometimes uh, not everybody can talk to everybody else. Um, but we have to remember that there are ways to communicate and, and how do we communicate and how do we create. And, and I think that, you know, like Jennifer was talking about, the SDWG offers one expression of that uh, creative space. Um, the senior Arctic officials offers another expression of that creative space. And so, um, you know, uh, going forward, it'll be interesting to see uh, how those innovations kind of uh, continue to, to sprout up in in response to the needs. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting to think that also some of the outcomes aren't necessarily ones that you would see written down in paper, but they're thought processes, dialogues, kind of developing shared understandings. Jennifer, over to you. I think um, that was the, you are someone, you're very interested, you know this area very well as a practitioner and also as a, as a scholar. What do you think was, what surprised you most about how Arctic cooperation responded to the the pause in activity and responding to Russia's reinvasion, but also what would you like to see happening in the years ahead? What are some of your well-founded expert dreams for Arctic governance? Yeah, uh, it's it's important to me, like uh, the with the pause, as, as Ed pointed out, um, it was a pause in what we saw on the outside. Um, but really there was a lot of very hard work going on inside to try to really puzzle through. There, there was no sort of walking away from the table. It was much more of a, we need to reflect on this carefully. Um, and so when, uh, when the, the pause was announced very shortly after the invasion of Ukraine, many people sort of had no idea. It was this vacuum of information. And for the Indigenous Peoples Organizations as well. So there was some frustration uh, that people really didn't have a sense of what was going on. But I think um, some time after that, when there was sort of a re-engagement, um, what we saw was that what came out of that sort of difficult period was a recommitment, an investment by all Arctic states. And so not necessarily for the same reasons and not necessarily with the same sort of um, uh, intention, 
but all uh, eight Arctic states, including Russia, um, made the decision to, that the Arctic Council and the engagement with the Arctic Council was an important mechanism and the recognizing its flexibility, recognizing its um, innovation and its way of doing work was important. And that included bringing Indigenous peoples back to the table and finding ways to, to make sure that it kept the spirit of what the Arctic Council is really about. I think the other thing is um, we saw, I mean, one of the critical pieces uh, is that the Arctic Council was actually chaired by Russia at the time of the invasion. Um, and so what we really needed to understand was that made it that much more difficult. Um, and there was no guarantee, there was no clear path forward from a transition from a Russian chairmanship to the, uh, the Norwegian chairship. Um, and, but we saw that happen. Um, and there was no guarantee, you know, that that would happen. And we, we know now that there was enough will by all involved uh, to see that transition take place. And then sort of as a follow on to that, the decision to have a commitment by all states to find a solution through the uh, creation of written procedures. Uh, so that meant that not everybody had to talk to each other in order to make decisions, but there was a mechanism by which decisions could be made. Um, it's not ideal. Uh, it's not going to work in all situations, but it demonstrates again this investment in trying to find solutions for moving forward. So those are, those are things that I think we can't take for granted that they, they happened. I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. I don't think we can sit back and say, okay, now everything's fine. I think we all know that this is still an extremely delicate time. Um, I think that recognizing that the Arctic Council is a sort of a central node in a, in a very rich network of organizations and institutions um, that do work that is incredibly important to the Arctic is important and that the Arctic Council has to live within that community and use its flexibility but also the flexibility of those other institutions to really make sure that the interests and priorities of the Arctic are not being forgotten in a global sort of tension and conflict kind of situation. And I believe that the, the one of the critical ways we do that is to really keep the people of the Arctic at the heart of the Arctic Council, at the heart of Arctic institutions, and to remember that we need to be remembering their interests and priorities and making sure that they're leaders, of whatever, whatever those institutions are, um, to make sure that they're really relevant and advancing the interests of people. And, and that means locally, that means nationally and, and regionally, but also internationally. And, um, and I think that, I mean, I obviously, I've, I'm an Arctic Council fanatic. I drank the Kool-Aid a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do think that this is a time when the Arctic Council has to invest in thinking of itself as part of a broader community of institutions. And that's where some of the flexibilities lie right now. I don't think the Arctic Council can do this alone. Uh, and so it has to work within that broader community of institutions. Great. That's really interesting. And it kind of but be, and we're going to move on to kind of think about the Arctic Council and the landscape of governance in the next question. But before we go too far from the pause and innovation, I wondered if you could just say a few words about the Wildland Fire Initiative, if I'm getting the title right, sure. because I think that's also an example of one of the ways that work was done that you kind of walked us so greatly through. Jen. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, so the Norwegian chairship just you know and in, in, in back in October announced the Wildland Fire Chairship Initiative, uh, which is something very near and dear to uh, Gwich'in Council International. You know we've been working on wildland fire issues for for quite a number of years, including uh, two projects at the Arctic Council, one in the EPPR working group, the Emergency Prevention uh, Preparedness and Response Working Group, and um, and then also one in uh, the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna Working Group. Uh, and those, those um, projects um, are about increasing cooperation around wildland fire in the Arctic, um, also increasing uh, our scientific knowledge about wildland fire. And th then they kind of started the dialogue at the Arctic Council to you know, really examine uh, what's happening with, with fire in the north. And we've seen this increasing uh, dilemma in the north, uh, which is that our resources and our knowledge about wildland fire in the north don't match the uh, the challenge that we collectively face. You know, uh, like I said earlier in the podcast, you know, there's been 40 million acres burned in, in Russia multiple times. Uh, Canada has experienced a, a 40 million acre season, you know, this last year that impacted air quality all across the United States as well and, and Europe. Um, Alaska has experienced uh, some very major uh, wildland fire seasons uh, in our homeland, in the Gwich'in homeland in Alaska. 
On the Alaska side of things, uh, 65% of our area has burned over the last 50 years. And so that really informed uh, our discussion uh, with, with wildland fire and how we need to collectively address it. Uh, Norway, uh, as part of their chairship, saw this dialogue and saw it also as a way to, uh, I think, to bring people back together, right? To bring t- people together and focus on a concern that we all share in common. And so um, something that uh, Sweden has experienced recently, uh, wildland fires in Iceland. Um, you know, when we had first started talking about this, it was kind of like a Gwich'in concern. And people hadn't really uh, experienced what we had experienced with it. And, uh, and then Sweden experienced, you know, a similar thing. And then pretty soon other uh, states experienced similar things. And then uh, and now we can we all kind of have this shared realization that this is something that we need to work on. This is something that we need to talk about, something that we don't really understand well and can impact the public in ways that um, I don't think are, are really well understood. You know, uh, in our homeland, in the Gwich'in homeland in Alaska and in the Yukon Territory, we have a special kind of permafrost called Yodoma. And that type of permafrost is extremely rich in greenhouse gases. There's over 480 gigaton of greenhouse gases in this special kind of permafrost. And uh, it's very fragile and very prone to rapid melt uh, should wildland fire impact that type of permafrost, right? And so uh, that has global climate implications, right? Um, I mean, that's fully like one half, more than one half the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere for the planet collectively. And it's in a very small area. It's an area solid, smaller than the size of Spain, which is, uh, you know, it's a it's a small area for Gwich'in people. <laughs> and, um, you know, we so uh, we really need to have a better understanding about how we work together to protect these areas that we're just beginning to learn the kind of impact that um, they could have if we don't cooperate well with each other. And so the Norwegian Wildland Fire Chairship Initiative really looks at trying to bring all all of the players around the Arctic, all the people around the world to just discuss wildland fire for a moment and, you know, what's actually happening here. I mean, even as we speak here today in, in Oslo, you know, we can see the climate disruption, right? We can see, we know the climate disruption going on in Colombia today. You know, uh, they're calling for aid uh, from the United States and Canada uh, and for the wildland fires that are devastating that country right now. And so, and we've seen across, you know, South America, other kinds of uh, wildland fires too. So it's not just in the Arctic, but this is something that we can collectively talk about. Great point, I think, about how what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic and vice versa. We're going to turn to global questions, but you want to join in on this. Yeah, I just wanted to really emphasize is what's striking about this example of wildland fire is Gwich'in Council International was championing this at the Arctic Council before it came uh, an international issue. Like in the the last sort of two years, we've really seen it hit the uh, the public imagination as an issue. And, and this is a perfect example of an issue at the Arctic Council that was brought forward by people whose this is their homelands where they understand that they saw the signals. And it actually took the Arctic Council a few years, but it was through the work of the, uh, the Gwich'in Council International trying to champion this and get it it on the, the agenda that it really demonstrates that when you bring other perspectives ju- than just the states, you can really be in a position to take a leadership role when you need to. And, and so it's a really interesting example of where the governance has really uh, been sort of demonstrated its capacity. Mm, absolutely. And we're going to turn now to kind of a discussion of global issues and leadership and how to get thinking about how to get the best resources involved in pressing Arctic challenges in the best possible way. Here at NUPI, we've had a project called the Lorax Project, funded by the European Research Council, where we've been looking, taking a starting point in the Arctic and looking at how other ecosystems are governed in the world. So we've looked at the Amazon, the Caspian area, and we've also seen, you know, around the world you can find other examples where peoples, states, et cetera, are anchoring cooperation in an ecosystem. And it brings these kind of new opportunities for innovating, for thinking anew about the ecosystem. And it also changes the relationships more generally around that. Like we've seen that one of my colleagues is doing research on the Amazon and sees that the Amazon states act as a functional block in key issues at the global level. I don't think we see that with the Arctic to the same degree. 
But what we do see is a very strong increase in kind of global actors, global interest, and understanding of a need to work with that there are these other institutions where an Arctic voice may really matter. But what's the best way forward for that? So that's kind of takes us to our next and last question. You know, given this global interest and given the interlinkages between Arctic and global issues that we've been talking about, what would be your kind of wish list for international organizations or non-Arctic states interested in making a contribution to addressing Arctic challenges going forward? Ooh, that's a big one. <laughs> Your top 10 wishes, or even two wishes. I have three. I'm not going with 10. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting. Um, one of the things, and it, ironically, this is something that's been said in the Arctic Council for quite some time, is there's a growing interest, um, but that interest has always been sort of at the senior levels in the in the sort of political realm, uh, going to the senior Arctic official meetings, uh, attending those meetings. And so, States outside of, of the Arctic and, and players outside of the Arctic have really sort of seen that as the go-to place. And for a long time, people who work at the working level have been saying, you really want to influence the work of the Arctic Council, then you need to be at the working level. Uh, and I, don't, I think that this is exactly the time where we need to be really emphasizing that message. We need to depoliticize as much as possible the work that is happening. Uh, and that means investing in actual the work. So, And this is where you can differentiate. So that's my... My other thing is, um, you know, at the political level right now, it's going to be extremely difficult to differentiate. Um, but there are really critical issues in the Arctic. We talked about wildland fires, permafrost thaw, um, all of the types of impacts of climate change, uh, all the types of contaminants and pollutants that, that move to the Arctic, microplastics, all these kinds of things are things that shouldn't, as much as possible, we should be working on outside of politics because they need to be addressed. And... This is an incredibly important time, and it's not to suggest that the geopolitical situation is not real and it's not serious, but it doesn't need to be treated as in isolation. It doesn't mean we need to block out all the other issues. So we need to really carefully reflect on how we can distinguish the, um, the issues that need to advance because they are going to continue to be there and how we can invest in them. And I really think that, that, that that's at the working level. And, there's a, and I believe there is a place um, for non-Arctic actors to contribute and support that work. And then, again, I'm not to, to continue on the, the same message, but it's really to recognize the leadership of the people that live in the Arctic and call it home. I think it really helps to clarify that if we invest in those things, um, those things don't need to be political. Um, those things are uh, about quality of life. Those things are about making the right kinds of decisions. Um, and I think that if we do that... and and in a time when people say that these things are important, it may not be about showing up at the big sort of political meetings. It may be committing to small projects and, and creating opportunities for co-production of knowledge at a very local level. But those things can have an impact, a global impact if we commit to them correctly. And those are the things that almost take more commitment and more resources exactly. to work steadily carefully and in a targeted way over time rather than having a kind of flashy one-off event. And, and yeah. the, the, the challenge is those things do take money. They take money and they take commitment and they take capacity. And sometimes we want the easy, quick, sort of flashy things. And these things are things we just need to double down and keep working on in a time when you may not be able to celebrate them in big political venues, but, but, but they, that doesn't mean the work doesn't need to be done. Thanks, Ed. Did Jennifer take all the wishes? It was a very good list. <laughs> it was a good list. No, I, I completely agree and I echo, echo her wishes. So that's three of mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I do think, though, seriously, when we, when we think about, um, you know, wishes for, for things that go like, you know, what could be, what, we, what could we hope for, right? And I think that, if, you know, the export of the model of the Arctic Council, I think, is something to be hoped for. And so we talk about like maybe the Amazonian countries serving as a, as a sort of a block, right? But why not have a Amazonian council, right? And have uh, the indigenous peoples of the Amazon uh, sitting at an equal table with Bolivia and Brazil and, uh, and so forth. And, and they know, don't. Right, yeah. right. We, we, there, there's absolutely no reason why that shouldn't happen, exactly. right? Or uh, like an Oceania council of, you know, uh, New Zealand, Maori and Aboriginal uh, folks in Australia and, 
and so forth. And so I, I think that the model, um, you know, one of consensus building, one of information sharing, one uh, dedicated to uh, the respect of the parties at the table and, and listening and trying to figure out the best solution for all of the peoples in, in these different regions, I think really does, um, you know, offer like hope for, and, you know, and not just hope, but also the uh, kinds of creative solutions that we need collectively to address the challenges that we're facing, right? And so if I had a, if I had a wish, that would be one wish. I also completely agree that working on the, you know, at, on things at the working group level, um, you know, I, I wish more people understood that too. Um, I wish more of the observers of the Arctic Council understood their role uh, to inform what's going on at the working group levels, so that they're not just quote unquote observing, but that by uh, by observing, they, they're welcome to speak and have interventions at those working group meetings. And some, some groups understand that, like maybe uh, WWF or uh, our friends over at the International Association of World Reindeer Herders, you know, they make great interventions at, at, uh, at uh, working group level. But, you know, uh, sometimes some of the states don't, right? Sometimes they sit there and they, they, they view it as we're going to observe rather than uh, we should speak up and how are we going to work together in the, in the best way. And I think when we have that kind of inclusivity where we say, okay, let's, let's get all the comments on the table and let's speak frankly with each other, right? Then we can have uh, better projects, better service for the people in the north, better service for people around the world, better service for our environment. And so, yeah, I, I would say that. Um, of course, I always... Um, would say too that I that I view personally I view the Arctic Council as a as a vessel for peace, right? And so I hope for peace, and you know I view all the projects that we do as as important to uh, advancing a dialogue uh, centered around peaceful inclusion of all peoples in, this, in the world, right? And we can't have that with uh, and simultaneously have conflict at the same time, and so you know as we discuss these things, we always have to kind of keep that in mind. Like how do we use these other areas of our common concern to, to bridge the gaps and uh, establish peaceful relations between uh, states, peoples. Uh, and of course that's born out of respect, respect for other peoples, respect for other states, respect for positions that are not your own. Wonderful wishes for the Arctic Council and Arctic governance and also global politics really going ahead. I want to thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your perspectives and experience. It's really been a privilege and a joy to chair this podcast. Thanks to all of you in the audience who have taken time to listen to this episode of Newpie's podcast, The World Stage. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thanks so much, Alana. Mm -hmm.